Hey friends, ETJ Writes here. Today we're doing another reading vlog. I haven't done one of those in a while. Normally I do my book ramblings with several books all at once, but uh, this is going to be a little bit different. I'm really close to the end of some of the books that I started reading last year, and I'm going to be finishing those very, very soon. I'll be talking about those in another video once I get done with them, but I thought it was time to start something new, something exciting. A lot of times when I go to secondhand bookstores, I just pick up something that looks cool, usually something from around the 70s or so, because it has a really interesting cover and the type of artwork that you see on those books isn't something that is replicated too much these days. When you see these old artworks, you know that you're going to pick up a story that is really, really awesome. With that being said, what book have I decided that I'm going to be focusing on? It's this one. This is called The Wayfarer Redemption, book one. So if I like it, there will be more in the series. Let's see, we have Locus, that must be a publication. They say, Sarah Douglas is the best and most exciting writer of commercial fantasy fiction to emerge from Australia, which already gives me high hopes for it because there's an author that I really like called Karen Miller. I discovered her one day in the library and I just devoured all her books in the span of a few months. She hasn't been writing as much as she wanted to because of a chronic illness that overtook her. But her last book that I read by her, I think it's called The Falcon Throne, it was a little bit Game of Throny, and I really, really enjoyed it. I've been eagerly awaiting her next book because of that. Every now and then she posts an update on her website. There's hope in sight that she will be back in the publishing game soon, and in the meantime we send her all our well wishes. But since she's an Australian author, fantasy author, and did great things, I'm looking forward to this one. Let's read the summary. At another time, in the distant land of Akar, the Akarites lived a prosperous life protected by vast and insurmountable mountains to the north. Duke Bornhold governed their land and upheld the teachings of the Seneschal and Arta the Plowman. But before the Akarites inhabited their land, according to law, it was ruled by the Forbidden Ones. A millennia-old prophecy was given when the Forbidden Ones were driven from Akar, and now the Akarites witness its manifestation. Akar is under attack by an evil lord from the north, Gorgriel. His ice demons strike from the sky and kill hundreds of brave warriors in the blink of an eye. All Akarites believe the end is near. One young woman, Faraday, betrothed of Duke Bornheld, learns that all she has been told about her people's history is untrue. While fleeing to safety from the dangerous land, Faraday rides with Axis, legendary leader of the Axe Wielders and hated half-brother of Bornheld, and a man Faraday secretly loves, although it would be death to admit it. Leaving the safe company of Bornheld and Axis, Faraday embarks upon the journey that will change her life forever. Not only fighting against the atrocities inflicted by a distortion of her land's history, but also fighting for one man's love. This grand and heroic story tells a tale of one woman's struggle to learn the truth of her people and change their hearts and their minds forever. She fights against oppressive forces to share this reality, and the truth will not desist until everyone knows the truth of the Stargate. Bit of a wordy summary, I do have to admit. Uh, one of the things we as authors work on is getting our blurbs down. There is a little bit about... Sarah Douglas here at the back, but I'll read that when I get to the end of the book. Something that's really fascinating and cool, though, is that while there is a map in the front of the book, there's also a map, a different map, at the back. So that'll be really fun and interesting to refer to. Of course, this also gives me hope for the book because any good adventure story has a map, and this one has two. <laughs> Another neat thing about this is I have a hardcover copy that I picked up somewhere, and it is thick. Boy, let me tell you. It has... Ooh, the big long glossary and the glossary is on page 444 wow the glossary is like five pages long uh and the end of the book is on page 433 now i just peeked at it really really quickly i did not look at the words on the page but here's something really cool i just took the jacket off feast your eyes on that that is a gorgeous cover just i love the way it's one big artwork a 
chose a really nice place to put the front text. Okay, so I have to put the jacket back on now. Very gently. Let's read the first chapter. Ooh, very nice fancy design here. It's by Tor, a Tom Doherty Associates book in New York. And it's got, look at this, beautiful table of contents. Table of contents has kind of gone out of style recently. It's actually kind of a mark of a self-published book now if you have table of contents in a fictional book, but it used to be something that all books had. Now I should make a caveat in a fictional print version of a book because all ebook versions, well not all, but through the major retailers are required to have them. That way you can jump around in your Kindle from chapter to chapter, which is very handy and very convenient. Ooh, and there is now a picture of a fort, Gorkin Fort, that has a keep, a retreat, and a square. And would you look at this? This is something Shadowversity would absolutely love because it is strategically drawn correctly. At least the blueprints are. We don't know if there's machiculations on the wall, but... Okay, ooh, we have a big poem that starts us off here. I'm not going to read too much of this book out loud, but I will read select pieces, and I think the prologue would be a great thing to do. And actually, there's a poem before the prologue, so here we go. The Prophecy of the Destroyer A day will come when born will be Two babes whose blood will tie them That born to wing and horn will hate The one they call the Starman Destroyer rises in the north And drives his ghostmen south Defenceless lie both flesh and field Before Gorgorail's ice To meet this threat you must release The Starman from his lies Revive Tensador fast and sure, forget the ancient war. For if plow, wing, and horn can't find the bridge to understanding, then Gorgrael earn his name and bring destruction hither. It doesn't seem to be rhyming so far. Hmm. Starman, listen, heed me well. Your power will destroy you if you should wield it in the fray ere these prefaces are met. The sentinels will walk abroad till power corrupts their hearts. A child will turn her head and cry, revealing ancient arts. A wife will hold in joy at night the slayer of her husband. The age-old souls, long in cribs, will sing of mortal land. The remade dead, fat with child, will birth abomination. A darker power will prove to be the father of salvation. Then waters will release bright eyes to form the rainbow scepter. Starman, listen, for I know that you can wield the scepter to bring Gorgrail to his knees and break the ice asunder. But even with the power in hand, your pathway is not sure. A traitor from within your camp will seek and plot to harm you. Let not your lover's pain distract, for this will mean your death. Destroyer's might lies in his hate, yet you must never follow. Forgiveness is the thing assured to save Tensidor's soul. I wonder if that would rhyme more if read in an Aussie accent. I have to wonder about that. I don't know, but... uh. I don't think it was always supposed to rhyme. Maybe it's it's more of a free verse, the prophecy of the destroyer, but it's kind of set up like a poem, so some of the words rhyme, they kind of read it that way. Okay, so we are just getting into the prologue, which is a bunch of pages long. I'll have to come back to you next time when I get back to the chapter. But uh, here we go with the prologue. The woman struggled through the knee-deep snow, the bundle of dead wood she had tied to her back, almost as great a burden as the weight of the child she carried in her belly. Her breath rasped in her throat before frosting heavily in the bitterly cold southerly wind. She was short and strong, her legs and shoulders finely muscled by twenty-eight years of hard-won survival in her harsh homeland. But she had always had the help and company of her people to aid her. Now she was alone. And this, her third child, she would have to bear without assistance give me some great fantasy vibes so far. We'll see how it goes. I'll check in with you next time on my Wayfarer's Redemption reading vlog. Hey guys, ETJ writes here. I'm about a quarter of the way through, not quite, but close to a quarter of the way through Wayfarer Redemption, so I figured it was time for a little update. Currently, I've gotten to a part of the story where they've just gotten to the Silent Woman Woods, 
which is really fun and really exciting because there's just something about fantasy stories where they're going on a good quest and there's just all these cool, exciting places that are dangerous, away from the norm, just a little bit different. What's really cool is that if you look at the summary of the book, it's about this girl called Faraday. But when you're reading the book, I mean, Faraday's in there, but it's more about Axis and the Axe brothers that he leads and the brother leaders and the who belongs to the Seneschal and what's going on in the kingdom. And there hasn't been a whole lot of like, how is Faraday important? But we're getting to that. And the author has done a great job of weaving everything in together. So it's like, well, why would Faraday have an excuse to be with them and be part of the story? Aha, we've set up this chain of events that leads all the way to this next chain of events and it all works together really nicely. There's a couple things that I just wanted to give my thoughts on as we go forward so far. I did get beyond the prologue, which was really fun. Uh, it ends a little bit bloody, a little bit, uh, a little bit scary in a way. It's really fun to read. I enjoyed it and it really set me up for what was happening next. We almost got like a double prologue in a way because it's about one person for most of it definitely the bad guy. And then the second prologue is about another person who is connected to the good guy. The place where I've gotten in the story now, I'm starting to see how those two are connected because of what happened in the prologue. I will say some things that I'm not super keen on with this story is the exposition. There's like a lot of exposition, sometimes really unnecessarily so. For example, there's this saying that they have, furrow wide, furrow deep. They follow this religion where the plow is very, very important. So they say this as part of their culture. And the author does say that it's like the phrase that's said by all the people throughout the land, except that you could have implied that by just having everyone say it. You didn't have to explain that. And there are lots of instances where that happens. In a way, it's kind of good because they, it sets up red herrings. Like there's this white cat that keeps showing up and it's really called attention to like, oh, they picked up the cat and then they put down the cat and then the cat wanted to be let out and then the cat was traveling with them on the road and stuff like that makes it really clear that the cat is important in some way, but the author doesn't explain why. It's this weird mishmash of over explaining and then not quite explaining enough. The not explaining enough is actually good because I love to put puzzle pieces together and it's not so thin that I'm left wondering what's going on at this stage in the story. I'm supposed to be wondering what's going on. I'm putting the puzzle pieces together, but there are other parts where I'm like, yeah, we could do without all this exposition. Let's just hurry it along. Let's go forward. But the author does spend a lot of time world building. And I love that about fantasy stories. I can just sink into that. And the plot's not half bad either. There is this weird kind of love triangle going on between the main character and the other main character and the main character's friend that they've known for a long time. And I'm not really sure where that's going to go. Um, probably I could do without too much romance. I do enjoy when it happens in the story organically and it does seem to be a little bit forced. The heroine so far, Faraday, she seems to be a little bit of a doormat. She's kind of like, oh, I'm gonna grow up and get married and my parents arranged this marriage for me and this is the way it's gonna go and I guess this is my path for right now, which is fine. I mean, there are definitely people who that's their life path and they are enjoying going that way. But for someone who's supposed to be the main character, I would have liked to see a little bit more feistiness to her. But that's just my personal preference and I'm sure the story will develop her character as she goes along. In fact, I'm already seeing some of that. Plot-wise, where we are in the story, so far we've kind of been led up to a certain point and then they said, and here's spoilers, the records were destroyed and Brother Jamie, the Seneschal, the leader of the brothers, he, uh, he was really glad that the records were destroyed. So now you start to see that the people who are supposed to be good are hiding something. They're protecting some kind of lost knowledge. There are secrets going on that we as a reader will have to discover and we've actually kind of already discovered. The other thing that really bothers me is, well it doesn't bother me so much as I just notice it every time it happens, is the head hopping. Now this is written more from an omniscient point of view where 
the reader gets to know everything that all the characters are thinking all the time. So we'll be talking about something from Bornheld, he's one of the dukes, his perspective, and then it'll say, it'll jump right to what Faraday, his fiance, is thinking, and then it'll jump to what Axis, his half-brother, is thinking, and then it'll jump back to what Faraday is thinking, and then in the middle of a scene, we'll jump hundreds of miles away to what these two other characters are thinking. In a way, it's a little bit like television. Sometimes when you have a scene and you jump back and forth between what's happening in present day and past, in this location and that location, but it's a little bit jarring in a book, especially when the current norm in books is to kind of stick with one character for a while before jumping over to another character. This is what I mean by like the quick short sections. And this is one that really stood out to me. So like, here's a section, this continues on from the previous page. And then here to, here is a section, and then right here is a tiny little section all by itself, and then it continues down to another section, and that ends up being a little bit <laughs> weird to go through because it's just so quick you're jumping back and forth. Now, it's done well. I can always tell when it's happening, and I'm not lost for whose head we're currently in, but it does kind of stand out in a way that I'm not used to in books that I've been reading. It is an older style. It's something I do a little bit in my first novel, Tadanbar of Havloth, not a lot, but there are a couple occasions when the one character has fallen asleep or passed out, and then we get to hear the story from the perspective of another character very briefly. This story does it a lot, and other stories of a certain time period when they were published tend to apply that more, because as we move through the world of publishing, certain types of styles fall in and out of favor. Something that is popular and lauded by people who love to read right now might be something that is completely trashed 10 years down the road. I actually now have to issue a correction. In the first part of this video, I said that there were two maps, but that's actually not the case. It's one big map spread between the first part of the book and the the last part of the book. As I was reading through the novel, I was like, oh, okay, so if they're here and I don't see this on the first map, but I go to the second map, okay, that's what's going on. It was just one long vertical map that they split in two, which is a little confusing at first, but hey, it's uh, really beautifully drawn. You can skip back to the first part of the video if you want to see that again, and it's really fun to follow along with. Another thing that I thought was kind of weird is that the author and maybe it's just the people in this world, but seems to have something against curls, which is really odd for me because there's this king that has curly hair and every time it's mentioned that he is, well, not curly hair, but if you think like the French kings of France where they had the gentle curls, it's like mentioned as a point of like, oh, he had curls when he was little and now that he's grown older, it's not respectable anymore. Why does he still have it? He looks foppish and weird. And I hope we don't really see that continuing as we go along because it's just a bit odd that the author or at least the people in this world have such a bias against it. But uh, that's, you know, as you're reading a book, there are things you like and things you don't like. And for the most part, I'm enjoying where this story is going so far. I've already been drawn into it. Usually when I read a book, I can tell pretty much straight away whether I'm gonna like it or not. And this book falls very firmly in the I like it so far category. And if I like something, I'm more predisposed to keep going with it and enjoying where the story is gonna end up. And like I said, it's part of a series. So if I really like it, maybe I'll keep going with the rest of the series. Well, that's all for now. I think I'll sign off there because like I said, I am close to 25% through and I'd like to check in again with a new video at the 50% mark. So check this book out for yourselves and until I see you next time, happy reading!